Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hefe Sports Podcast. We got the All-Star Game this weekend. And in honor of the big festivities, we got a special guest joining me today. He is a former NBA All-Star, former NBA champion, and coach. The one, the only, Butch Beard. Jeffrey, good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. I'm so excited to virtually meet you. You were recently in the news. You actually had a letter that was posted nationally talking about the University of Louisville and how they can improve. So can you go into a little bit about what that letter was about? Well, the letter was about Jeffrey, uh, and it's not only at the University of Louisville, it's at the collegiate level of having more diversity. And when I say in, in that sense, they have more black males as role models, especially in the sports department, in the athletic department, in men's basketball, and also in football, because those are the two generating revenue sports. A lot of the schools do not have they do not have head basketball or head football coaches that young men like you can look up to and say, hey, maybe I would like to be like him. You know, I know they have their assistant coaches there, but assistant coaches recruit young men like you. OK, but they don't have the same gravitas as a head coach. A head coach is the one that you go to when you have a problem about life that you could discuss it with them. And when you don't have one that looks like you, it's hard for you to make that decision to go and talk to him about your issues. So uh, I wrote the university because they have 22, they have 22 sports. And at this particular time, they have one black coach and that's in tennis. And they have never in, the history of the University of Louisville interviewed a black man for the men's basketball coach. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> wow. Never knew that. Yeah. But Louisville is perceived to be the black school in the state of Kentucky. Hmm. Wasn't it created actually to go against Kentucky and like offer a better opportunity for black <laughs> students and people of color? All right. I'm going to help you on that one. Okay because I'm part of it. You're looking at the reason why the University of Louisville has the image that they have, okay? Wade Houston, Eddie Whitehead, two Ohio guys. Well, no, Eddie was from Ohio and Wade was from Tennessee, Alcoa. And then the following year, a guy by the name of Dave Gilbert from Dayton, they were the first to come to the University of Louisville. And in the 60s, it wasn't easy, okay? Then it was Wes Unsell, the following year after Dave Gilbert, and myself. So Wes Unsell and I were being heavily recruited by the University of Kentucky to integrate the SEC. Neither, neither one of us chose to do that. I, I actually followed Wes. Wes had his own reasons for not wanting to go to the University of Kentucky. And to be a pioneer, you go through a lot. Okay. It wasn't easy at the University of Louisville either, because now I'm going to really blow your mind. We were talking before the podcast, and you were talking about 100 African-American, you know, football players, basically, you know, at the time, at, at the school when you were there. Well, there were 15 of us in all the sports. 15, that a, 15 African-American student athletes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Okay, 15. All right. And we had to bond as a family and help each other. Here, here's what we did, son. If you had trouble in a certain subject, class, and you were strong in that class, you helped that guy to get through so he would be eligible to play. Because when we walked in the classrooms, most of the time, the professors would look at us and say, you're not smart enough to pass this class. Mm. So the reason why for the letter, let's get back to that. All of that being said, the men's basketball program, as you know it today, 
became what it is when Wes Unsel walked on that campus. Right. Okay. And <laughs> they don't have anything of recognition of Wes Unsel. They have his jersey retired, but not for what he accomplished there. They have a dorm name for Johnny Unitas, who played at the University of Louisville, as you know. Mm -hmm. They have a statue of Johnny Unitas. He didn't accomplish anything compared to what Wes Unsel accomplished as a basketball player there. We have a court named after Denny Crum, which is the right thing to do during his era. Now they're building another dorm and they're going to name it after Denny Crum, but we still don't have anything for Wes Unsel, which brought you to the University of Louisville. Mm -hmm. Now, why do, you, why do you think that's the case? Like, why is it taking the university this long to even think about, or even like, it took you really to get them to think about Wes Unsel. Why did it take them that long? <laughs> you want me to be candid? Go ahead. We need <laughs> well, to hear as, this. We need to hear as, this. No, right no, now. no. A, 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 Jeffrey, as, as, I, as I had the conversation with the president of the university, and I told her, I'm not going to call you racist, but you have racist tendencies. So you need to look into this and see if you can do something to make this better. This is 2021. Mm -hmm. This is not 1960. We understood, you know, when we went there and I, I, Wes went in 64, I went in 65. We understand, you know, how the world was then. But now you have to think entirely different. I mean, they walked around with Black Lives Matters, you know, after Breonna Taylor, as if, you know, made you feel good. Right. Did not make me feel good. And I'll tell you the reason why. Black Lives Matter when you give jobs to black people. See, your ability to play a sport makes that coach, makes him make a lot of money. Basically generational wealth for him and his family. But they tell you, well, you're gonna go pro and make your money. Well, we all don't go pro. As we know, the percentages are very low. So, you know, <laughs> we have to, when I say we, we as African-American males, we have to think of another avenue of trying to exist on this planet and doing it the right way. We see the LeBron James, we see, you know, right now the, the Durants and all the money they make. And most of the kids say, man, that's who I am. I'm better than he is. No, no, no. They are generational players. Okay. And if you're lucky enough to make it, then hopefully you will understand how fortunate you are. I was fortunate enough to play 10 years. I didn't make that kind of money, but I was fortunate enough to, you know, to be in the NBA and to parlay that into other things. Mm -hmm. Now, Butch, I, I read your letter to the university and mm -hmm. you mentioned that you don't want any of your accomplishments or your name because you have your jersey retired in the Yum Center as well as um, Wes. And you said that you don't want your accomplishments or name mentioned until there's change. So what change do you want to see with the University of Louisville? Well, I, I, I want to see not only black, more black coaches in head coaching positions. OK, I want to see the university to identify young men like you who they think could be associate athletic directors, put them in the system. Then eventually down the road, you can be an athletic director someplace else. So I want I want you all to see people who have done good things. OK, now. The reason why I said what I said is because I know that they had used my name, okay, in the past, not, not in the present anymore because I'm too old, <laughs> but in the past, they've used my names to get young men like you 
to attend the University of Louisville. And you, you know, most kids don't know who I am. Most kids don't know that when Wes Unsel walked on that campus in 64 and I followed in 65, everything changed as far as men's basketball was concerned. Mm -hmm. All you will know about is the Denny Crum era, okay? But most of the kids in the Denny Crum era, well, they were from Louisville. The roster was really a Louisville, you know, roster. Kids stayed, they stayed home. They played for the University of Louisville. And then when Rick came and he was there for 17 to 18 years, if Rick Bettino, I want people to know when Rick Bettino came, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't go out and get, you know, local kids or even kids in the state. He went out and got other kids. And those kids have no idea how this all started. Hmm. And so therefore, they don't know what I did anyway. So it doesn't matter. Hmm. I can't I can't roll with that. Okay. Yeah. Completely understand. Well, Butch, before we move on, I just want to thank you so much because like you're saying, you opened the door for me to play sports at the University of Louisville. So I just appreciate what you did. I appreciate what you went through. And thank you from the bottom <laughs> of my heart. <laughs> well, well, I wasn't the only one. Those 15, the four years that I was there, those 15, we stuck together. We were a family. Hmm. You know, we went to church together. I mean, it, it, it was amazing how we stuck together and we talk about it because we have what we call memory, memory lane. And it started after Wes passed that we started to zoom and get together. And so we just started talking about our experience at the university of Louisville when we were there in the sixties. And it brought back some good memories, but it also brought back, you know, some bad things that went on in our lives that we had to overcome. See, this is what we need to have happen in our country right now. We need these stories told because, I mean, as you said, West passed, but there's still a good amount of you who can retell the story because I'm going to be honest, before I got the connection through Mr. Clemens, I had no idea who you were. <laughs> and <laughs> just hearing all of the stories that you have and like your insider information that you have from way back in the day when things first got started, that needs to be told to my generation and generations further beyond me. Yes. So yes. We need to have something where maybe it's like a 30 for 30 with ESPN, but somehow like specifically for the university of Louisville, just telling the story. Cause we all come from somewhere. Yes. We cannot forget these stories of the past trailblazers like yourself who really just paved the way for everybody. So we need to get that to happen. What is it about coaching that made you want to get into it first? And how did you get into coaching? Well, I got into coaching. <laughs> I had a great experience in high school. In the state of Kentucky, uh, my junior and senior year, we went to the state tournament. My junior year, we lost to West Unsel in Seneca High School in high school. Then my senior year, we came back and we won the state title. Uh, those two years, because we didn't have football in our school at the time. So in high school in the 60s in the state of Kentucky, you could play as many games as you wanted to. So those two years, our record was 67 and 8. 30 and 5 my junior year when we lost to West. And when I was a senior, we were 37 and 3. So my high school coach was the first guy who influenced me. He, he dangled a carrot in front of me all the time, telling me, you know, if you're good enough, you can go to college. You know what I'm saying? So he dangled that carrot and I bit, all right? Then I was fortunate enough when I got to the pros. I'm not going to say at the University of Louisville that the coaches, you know, motivated me to want to be a professional because they didn't. That was, that was me. That's right. when I come back to being a prude, well, we didn't have what you had. We didn't have the strength and conditioning coaches at the time. And I was used to doing a certain thing. I would go and run. I would try to work out on my own when I could have been out chasing women, but I didn't. Okay. And it got me into the pros. And when I got into the pros, I was fortunate enough to be around two people 
that made me want to be a coach. One was in 1975 when I got traded to the Golden State Warriors and we won the championship. Al Adams, who's a black man, okay? He was a black coach. He coached us to a championship. I got traded and went to the New York Knicks. And the other one is a coaching legend, Red Hosman, a Jewish guy, okay? Who I don't know what he saw in me. When I got, when I got released, he called me up. Like two weeks later, he says, hey, <laughs> I can't tell you what he called me because it was a Jewish way of, of affection. <laughs> it was a ho. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he says, you want to come back? I said, what, Red as a player? He says, no, as a coach. And so I came back and he taught me how to coach. Here's what Red Hosman was way ahead of his time because he played games with with guys all the time he would find you if you were late for a film session he'd find you five dollars that, that, that's no money but he'd find you okay and here's why he'd find you he had a little grandfather clock that he he kept in his pocket and it was always five minutes fast and so if you got there on time you still were five minutes late okay mm -hmm. and he wouldn't start a film session until you gave him the five dollars <laughs> so, he, he, you know, he played those little games, but here's where I found out about him. He was the fairest guy I know at that level of sports. He brought in guys for training camp to get guys like Earl Monroe, Clyde, Frazier, to get them in shape, okay? And he made sure that they had X amount of dollars when they left, all right? I mean, it was a contract, but that's who he was. And he never lied to any of his players, to my knowledge. And we were, hey, to come to think about it, the New York Knicks under Red Hosman was the first to have an all-black in roster. Wow. 1979-80. But so let me, let me stop you there. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking in my head, like you have trailblazed so much at Louisville with the Knicks. And then you mentioned your um, world, your world championship, your first, the black yes. coach. That was the first time in NBA history where your second coach black second time, second. Bill Russell did it in '69 as a player coach when they beat the LA Lakers. Okay, the Boston Celtics. Okay, he he had taken over. He had taken over for Red Arback. All right. Then Al, who was already in the league at the time, was coaching in the NBA with the Golden State Warriors, he and a guy by the, hey, a guy from Ohio State, Joe Roberts, who played basketball with Jerry, with Jerry Lucas and, and John Havlicek, Mel Noel, all right? Joe was his assistant, which was a black guy, okay? They were our coaches. And at times they would go out and scout and we would run practice ourselves. It's not like it is now. <laughs> no okay never where there's a coach for almost every player so you you understand the pride of trying to well at least for me i'll never forget because al had a conversation with me and another guy by the name of charles johnson who played at uc berkeley and he told us we were going to start in his backcourt that year he said it's not going to be a popular decision and i'll never forget when i said with my big mouth i said al we won't let you down and we didn't we won a championship right but i was gonna say the first this was the first world championship with a black coach versus a black coach and coach yes 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 that was the yes. first time ever right yes yes with kc jones with the washington bullets and al adams with the golden state warriors wow what was the like was there any commotion from nba fans at that time well they were starting to change they were starting to change it it, it the, the league was starting to change okay uh it's not like it is now i i i also had another article that was in the new york daily news about the nba because when i 
came back as Red Hoseman's assistant, the coaches association got started. So I'm one of the charter members of the coaches association. And to think after the number of years that I've been in it, we only have now, I think, nine black head coaches. I think, I'm not sure, it could be seven, all right? We should be better than that in the NBA. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the reasons why when all the things that happened last year with Black Lives Matter, being in the bubble, players, you know, you know being socially conscious, I wanted to talk to Chris Paul and also to LeBron about, hey, look, guys, you're in the right direction, but you need to go back to the owners and say, we need more black head coaches and we need more black general managers. Those are people who have power in the NBA. And so I was, <laughs> I, I, I talked to a guy for the <laughs> Daily News uh, and I said, the NBA is not doing their job either. They're fooling the public about being, you know, a black league, but it's not because the people who make decisions are not black people. Shoot, you forget that sometimes, like with all the stuff that was happening last summer, it seemed like the NBA was on the front, on the forefront with that. Yes. yes. Black Lives Matter on the court, decals, kneeling, all that stuff. Yes. But then you have yes. to, you, like, you just forget that coaches, all of them were virtually white. Um, <laughs> like besides Doc Rivers, I can't think of another coach that was in there that was black. There and you go. General managers, white. Owners, white. Like it's just, you get fooled by so much display, so much glitz and glamor that you really forget at the core that there's still a major problem in yes. basketball. Well, well, the NBA, Michael Jordan, has the Charlotte Hornets. He's the, he's the majority oh, right, owner there. Right. Okay. So I guess in the NBA's eyes, they say, well, Mike should hire all the black people. <laughs> well, Mike doesn't hire any black people. Okay. <laughs> I just want you to know. But I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying that that's, that may be something that they are thinking about, but that's, it's still, it's still not what it should be. Mm -hmm. And we have to do a better job of, you know, of getting that across and, putting it on people's minds because the future is more important right now than the present. The present is the present. There's not much you can do about it, but the future we can do something about. My career hasn't been, you know, the NBA looks at guys who have great careers and if they make a statement, they may listen. Okay. I had a good career. I didn't have a great career. All right. So they, they'll look, they'll listen to what I have to say and they will downplay it like, oh, he's angry. No, I'm not angry. I'm lucky that I, you know, had the career that I had. But I also was there when things were much worse and it's not much better. Son, you're looking at, you're looking at the first, you're looking at one of the first former players who was a TV color commentator in a sport in the 80s. You had OJ Simpson doing Monday night football, okay? And guess who was doing color commentating in the, in the city of New York? Me. We were one of the first. Hmm. That is insane. That is, that is really insane. If I'm being honest, I got to call you a basketball connoisseur. You're like a renaissance man, a modern day bas basketball <laughs> renaissance man. You've done it all. Player, coach, commentator. It's amazing. All right, let's talk about some NBA. Okay. So we got the All-Star game coming up this weekend. Who are you looking at? Is there anybody that's catching your eye right now? I'm not watching much NBA. I watch it. Uh, I'm not in tune with what's going on. I, I, I'm watching the Lakers a little bit more when I get an opportunity to watch them because they are reigning world champs. 
and it's hard to, it really is hard to repeat. And it just seems to me if Anthony Davis can't get back to 100%, I don't see them winning again. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 I knew that when James Harden got to the Nets, having James Harden, Irving, and Durant, that they would be hard to beat because they would outscore people. And that's what they've done. Okay, they they just simply outscore people. I don't see a defensive concept yet because a defensive scheme, because I, when I watch it, I watch it entirely different than you do. I'm, I'm watching I'm watching a game entirely different than you. You're watching to see somebody, you know, cross over and break somebody's ankles and dunk on them. See, I'm watching something else. I'm watching to see what they're doing defensively. Are they rotating on high pick and rolls? You know, are they blitzing on high picking on certain high pick and rolls or side pick and rolls? I'm watching to see what they're doing. I'm watching to see when they come back in defensive transition, if they're if they're picking up the ball early or if they're letting people penetrate so they can kick the ball to the corners to shoot. See, so I'm watching it entirely different. Very, it sounds like it's very technical. Yeah, but but that's what see, Jeffrey, that's what it's been all my life. Okay. I enjoy watching it in that sense, but that's that's the way I watch it because that's what I understand. All right. So uh, I, I do like I do like the Nets in the East. Uh, you have a number of teams in the West. Utah, of course, is playing extremely well right now with Donovan Mitchell, you know, being their leader. Cardinal. Uh huh. And so I don't know if see you, you got to make even though they did well last year. And they had that great series with Denver in, in the bubble. They still haven't gotten over the hump yet. Maybe they will this year. So, I, you know, uh, at the end of March, I will really start to try to figure out who I think is going to be okay. I feel like a lot of this game right now, like people are still getting their feet wet. Like they're really starting to hit their prime, get in that second gear before we get into third gear and fourth gear down where the playoffs are like this is a time where it's like all right we had our fun we got our legs we got our stamina back but now it's time to hit it yep and, and here's the other thing jeffrey that you know they talk about but you don't understand it until you do it it was a short preseason, mm -hmm. and for the teams that were in the bubble see they played basketball much longer than they would have if the regular season had been over and they didn't, you know, they didn't uh, uh, were, were in the bubble or in the playoffs and your body takes a toll. LeBron, I know they would like to give him some, you know, some, some playing time off to get him ready for the playoffs because I mean, we're watching greatness in him. That is truly remarkable. Uh, I would knock on wood. Hopefully he won't ever have a bad injury, you know, because of the number of minutes that he plays. And this year he didn't have the time off that he had, that he's had in the past. So I'm hoping that doesn't come and bite him. It's already bitten Anthony Davis, who is injury prone anyway. Right. Okay. He's been injury prone all of his pro career. So that's the reason why the Laker team is the one that I'm watching just to see if they can get healthy and see if they can, you know, start to say and get focused to try to defend their, their title. If Anthony Davis isn't there, I think it's a wrap. I mean, we've seen yeah, what yeah. the past four or five games have been straight losses. LeBron's out there by himself with a whole bunch of role players, good role players, but they need that second option. Yes. Yes. They need him. Yes. Yes, we, you saw what happened to the Golden State Warriors. They made a run four out of five years where, you know, they were in the playoffs. And then you saw that eventually, you know, Clay goes down, Curry went down. Of course, Durant went down. Drayvon is not even anywhere near the player that he was when they won, you know, when they were winning championships. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot of wear and tear. 
Yeah. It's a lot of wear and tear. It I really is. People don't realize too. I mean, at least I don't even realize it. Like going to the playoffs every single year, going to the finals three to four straight years. I really just forget how much of a toll that has on you. Cause you're going into, what is it? Like October when the NBA mm-hmm. season starts around mm-hmm. then to mm-hmm. June. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. And right back after it, July, August, and you're still like in the gym, you're still preparing and mm-hmm. still like trying to keep that shot together. It's really like all year sport. Yeah. And, and it is, I, I can only, I can only tell you through experience when we won the championship in 75 with the Golden State Warriors, uh, after we won the championship, I had lost 20 pounds. I played all 82 games that year plus the playoffs, I had lost 20 pounds. I tried not picking up a basketball until after the 4th of July because I had tendonitis in my knees. It, 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 it really, I, I'm just telling you, the wear and tear is remarkable on the body. And like I said, it, 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 I'm just so amazed that LeBron, who has a great body as it is, has been able to sustain and play at the level that he's played at. Yeah. And I can't help but think like medicine has came so far in this time. We're in 2021. We got all these things that can keep your body right. Back when you played, <laughs> like <laughs> that had to be, that had to be something. Cause I, I talked to Oscar Robertson um, this summer, this past summer. And he told me like every single day, he'd have to tape up his ankles. There you go. Is that that was that's accurate see I, I, I i'm just that you you're talking about my idol okay big o's my idol all right he's my idol but back in the day rookies see now everything we travel we traveled the commercially you caught the first flight out every morning so that meant you were up at four o'clock in the morning to catch a six o'clock flight to go to the next city to play if you were a rookie, you normally carried the tape for that road trip, okay? <laughs> oh, so you had a trainer sometimes, and like the big old said, I learned to tape my ankles, okay, my first two years in the league. Uh, these guys don't even know how good they have it. You know, they, they don't. I mean, they have private planes. They have, they have food when they get on the plane I mean, and they still have the per diem on top of that. Right. And it, it's just, it's mind boggling where, you know, where the league is now to where it was when I came in and where, Oh, Oh, is, is, is probably seen as a rebel in the mere fact that he fought the owners to make it better for the players. And thus the reason why Oscar Robinson does not have, positions like Jerry West has had all of his after his playing career is over, Mm -hmm. which I think is a crime. So I was watching a Knicks, a little Knicks documentary last night about when you first got to the team and you told a story about when you and Clyde went to a grocery store and (laughs) I was getting I was getting weak when I heard that story. So can you please share that story with my listeners? Well, my my I got picked up off of waivers, so I come to New York, and that was after our second practice. We practiced downtown. The Knicks didn't even have a practice facility. We practiced everywhere. So we practiced at this place called Pace College, which was downtown. Normally. I take the subway down after the, I was taught how to do that. Okay. So Clyde was on his way back up. I lived on the East side. He lived on the East side. I lived up in the eighties. He lived in the fifties. He lived in the high rent district. I lived in the low rent district. So he said, bid, you want to ride uptown with me, bid? I'm, I'm got to go uptown. Want to ride uptown? I said, yeah. So we're in his, we're in his Rolls Royce. Okay. We're driving up uptown and we stopped and I said hey man 
just let's stop right here in front of you know in front of this store here because I got to get some I got to get some vegetables and stuff and they know me blah blah blah. So we walk in and he walks in behind me and it was Chinese that, that owned the owned the store. Ah, number ten, number ten. Oh, that number ten. Oh, number ten in the next number ten. I said, hell, man, I'm number nine. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and people came from everywhere. You couldn't even get out of the store. I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, yeah, he's an icon. There's no question about it. He's an icon. And as we got out, he said, beard, you see what I mean? I just can't be out here, beard, all the time like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it was so funny. It was so funny. I had that. And then I had Reggie Jackson <laughs> with the Yankees who lived like two blocks away. And he'd be running around in his doggone Rolls Royce. Uh, uh, it, you know, I was a subway type of guy. I didn't have that kind of money. <laughs> 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 yeah, you didn't, you didn't have the um, umbrella coming in cars. Coming there you go. There you go. Cars with money. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh for God. sure. Oh my God. That is, that's hilarious. And then one other question. So I had, I saw in the same video, you said that Phil Jackson was a physical teammate. And to me, like when I think of Phil Jackson, I think, okay, the mellow Zen master coach from the Lakers. Now I can't ever see him being physical. Like, do you have a specific moment where you remember him being overly physical? Oh, come on. You, you watch Phil play in those old, old, old tapes. You see the way Phil ran around with his elbows all tucked out all over unorthodox and stuff. One day, Phil Jackson in practice, okay, he not only knocked Bob McAdoo out, he got Tom McMillan, hit Spencer, hit Clyde, then Red Hoseman said, oh, hell no, we got to close practice, Phil, and we won't even have a game tomorrow, <laughs> Okay. I mean, it, it, it's not like he was trying to do it. It was just, he was so unorthodox. And, <laughs> and I was always glad that Phil was on my team, okay? Mm -hmm. when, we, when we scrimmaged, at least I stood a chance to survive that madness. <laughs> but he was vicious. Are you kidding me? Oh, with those elbows he had? Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> That is unbelievable to me because every time I see him, he's always like, I'm Phil Jackson. I'm so mellow. I'm cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> and just oh. to hear him like physical, like body and people, that's. Oh, wow. yes. Oh, yes. But, but he didn't do it on purpose. That was just his style of play. Mm. Okay. It was, I, I don't think he did a lot of stuff on purpose. It was just his style of play. And yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you, Bob McAdoo threw about. 15 balls at that dude after you get hit one time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh Lord. Oh. Hey, some of those some of those scrimmages and practices were worth the price of admission. Mm. Man, I wish I was around during that time. I just to be a fly, a fly in the gymnasium during that time. I'm telling you. You would have loved it. You would have loved it. You would have loved it. Well, Butch, I appreciate you for stopping by. Thank you again. I just want to take this time to thank you for everything you did with Louisville, with the NBA. I mean, I'm a huge NBA fan and I know the game would not be where it is today without your voice and the voice of all those people who really got in and started the ground floor, making the NBA what it is today. So thank you so much for coming on and thank you for all that you've done for the game. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. I, I'm so happy that Clem and I were able to get us together. That's another. Clem and I, we, we share a lot in common, okay? We were at, I'll, I'll give you this before you, we go. Clem was traded for Walt Frazier, and Clem and I split time as point guard at the time when he left. And so one day, we're on our way to practice. I get the New York Post, and they said, excess baggage. They got Clem's picture and my picture. <laughs> 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 they were trying to run us out of New York. 
I said, Lord, have mercy. I said, man, you can't. I said, one thing you can't do now, don't read the paper, Butch. Please don't read the paper, okay? <laughs> Not anymore. I said, Clem, I, I, I'll never forget. I got off the subway and I walked to practice to, to the building. I go in. I said, hey, man. I said, uh, if I'm you, I take my excess baggage and I go to the other end of the dressing room so nobody will know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness oh lord i'm telling you <laughs> oh, but it's all good okay